we are at Higher 24 in Brisbane, and I've got an exciting episode. We don't usually do three-person episodes, but we, uh, we've got Hallett, and we have United Forklift and Access, so we've got Dave Maxwell and Keith Clark. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so I am, um, I don't, well, to be honest, I don't know a lot about both your companies, <laughs> so I'm also want to like learn a bit more about uh, both your organizations, uh, what what your uh, involvement is with the Hire Association and then how you guys collaborate uh, as a company as well because it's really interesting to see what the important uh, relationships is between a supplier to, uh, to these hire and sales organisations as well. So maybe just first, Keith, I'll get you to introduce yourself and then yeah. Hall it. Um, so yeah, Keith Clark, I'm the General Manager of Hall of Australia. Uh, I've been in the rental space, the EW space for about 21 years. I spent close to seven years with Jeannie and now almost 14 years with Hallett. Um, president of the EWPA in Victoria, sit on the board of the EWPA, I've been involved in the EWPA for close to probably 18 years, just sitting on committees around, uh, around the traps. So, been around it for a little while. Very nice, and Dave? So, David Maxwell, I'm the Managing Director for United Forklifts and Access Solutions. Uh, been with the business 32 years, um, we have a number of people that have been with the business a long time, but our starting was uh, in a small company called WA Fork Trucks and WA Access in Western Australia, um, and then we were bought out by private equity and developed into uh, United um, in 2005, and then did a lot of acquisitions to take what we had in Western Australia and make it national. Um, you would have probably heard of Doug Rawlings. Doug Rawlings was the president of the EWPA. He actually is our branch manager. He's been with the business for over 20 years as well. Um, and that's our connection strongly with the EWPA and HRIA. Uh, we also were the rental company of the year in 2018, I think it was. Oh, very nice. So you gave me a slide and I was looking at the history a little bit. Like a lot has happened uh, since, uh, since the late 80s. So, I guess the, the growth, like if we go back to um, when the company first started to today, like what is the size difference now? So when I started, um, there was 20 employees and we were turning over about 4 million a year. Um, and today we employ about 455 employees and turn over over 330 mil a year. Wow, that's crazy. And then on the, on the Hallett side, so um, there was a, a big milestone with you guys, 5,000 machines that you've... Yeah, now sold sold. These guys. So I guess like maybe talk through how that relationship first started potentially. Yeah, I think it was uh, it was just the year before I started. So I started in 2010 and in uh, 2009, I think we sold three machines. I think it was a couple of boom lifts and one rough terrain scissor. And uh, the journey started there and I joined about six or eight months after that, and I remember coming over the, for the first time and sitting with yourself and, and Andrew McDonald and Trent, um, who were three of the key figures still in the business today, and talked about how we could try and partner up together, and you guys were looking for someone to partner with, and we were looking for someone to partner with to do our retail sales. Um, and it was the, the GFC, you know, the global financial crisis was, was, was real. The global business had uh, a 70% downturn in one year. So, you know, our business here in Australia was really also quite a, quite a struggle and um, yeah, we, we partnered with United and it's been nothing but a, a joyous relationship ever since. And I think, you know, the, the reason it's been so successful, I think, is we give each other probably very clear and transparent feedback, you know, and, you know, the, and the team have really helped us improve our quality and our design and so forth by really coming to us with good detail about you know some issues or problems that they've found and you know, we've put that feedback straight back to the factories and they've actually come back with a solution so we would present that to our factories and then we'd meet six months or a year later with a solution on this is the problem you found and here's the solution we're, we're putting in place to, to make you know rectify it. Mm. And you guys did a milestone as well, 25 years? 25 years, yeah. So uh, yesterday we actually had our uh, CEO, Alexander, uh, is, is in the country and he flew direct from Paris to Melbourne uh, for lunch and then flew from, uh, from Melbourne up here to Brisbane to, uh, to be at the show. But yeah, 25 years here in Australia is a, definitely a big milestone. Yeah. 
And so 5,000 machines is obviously an amazing partnership. So, so why 5,000 machines? Like why, why haul it? Uh, why haul it? Well, our history, um, so we've had a history with, we started initially with WA Access, we were with Snorkel, um, and then we moved to JLG. Um, but haul it, uh, we actually found um, they were very uh, happy to work with us and continuing to uh, develop their product and be innovative in their product. As Keith said, they had their people come down from France and sit with our actual sales, BDMs and so on to understand what the customer needs were and develop that. Um, the relationship started off slow, um, so we actually signed the national dealership, uh, reseller agreement in 2012. And you know, we took a while to get going, finding the right people and so on, but uh, we now have a fantastic team um, that do very, very well in selling the product nationally. So we've got a person in WA, one in Sydney, one in Melbourne and one in Brisbane um, that just focus on selling the Hallett product. Yeah, so I think you said you've got about 2,500 machines in your rental fleet from Hallett, but then you're also selling the machines. So talk about the dynamic between like renting the machines out and then selling the machines direct. I think it's one of the unique models that we have as a company. Uh, number one in that we're sales, service and rental. So we do also retail service as well as the sales and the, and the rental. Um, and we do forklifts and access. So it's also a different dynamic as well because both are quite different. Uh, but it gives us a spread of um, being a one-stop shop for our customers because we do from the small electric forklifts right up to the big container handlers and reach stackers. Um, but we also do the, the full access range and telehandler range. Um, and the suppliers that we have and that we work with have been really instrumental to who we are. Um, one of our slogans is we like to have quality product with quality people. Um, and that's definitely what we've achieved. So the rental side, we actually do um, differently in the fork truck space versus the access. The fork trucks, is, a lot of it is more long-term rental. Um, so we have our salespeople usually do do the long-term rental uh, as well as selling. On the access space, our salespeople are different from our rental people because the access is day-to-day -day casual rental. And so we have a dedicated team of access rental BDMs that are out there doing the rental mm -hmm. uh, and dedicated salespeople doing the selling. Yeah. And so is there much training from all that in supporting that sales? Because it's obviously a very different way of, of engaging with a customer, renting versus sales. And then yeah. obviously you're selling direct to these these rental businesses, but then now they're selling direct to the public. Like, how does that dynamic work? Yeah, so we actually, we well, like, actually locally built tra um, training to do both ways. So for capital sales, we we do a lot of training. We did some only two weeks ago, two or three weeks ago with the United team. We brought their sales team into Melbourne, um, spent two days doing really detailed feature function benefit, you know, looking at what the competition has, how we can place ourselves with, you know, added value and innovation. Um, and then we also then designed rental training because not only for United, but for all rental companies, it's all well and good me saying that, you know, my machine's the greatest 90 foot scissor or 45 foot knuckle boom in the market. But if I'm a rental company and I've got 10 brands and you go out and say, hey, the whole of the best one and then tomorrow the a JLG or whatever turns up on site. So it's the training we do for rental is more about how to add value to their customer on site. Mm. Yeah, and then obviously 5,000 machines and your fleet is obviously much bigger than that mm. overall. <clears throat> There's a lot of maintenance that goes along with that. So you've got dedicated service teams. So how does the service uh, collaboration work between uh, Hallett and United? Oh, uh, service has been very, very good from Hallett. We do have issues and um, so on that we can lean direct on their people. They've got. Uh, dedicated um, people that do training for our service technicians as well, uh, which we utilise uh, around the country. Um, so the service side, we always need to make sure our people are up skilled and know the product and know what they're doing. Uh, so it's very important for all of our OEMs to provide that training for our technical support people as well. Yeah. And so you guys have a dedicated support so field service team that supports these companies as well? Yeah, so field service in, in all the major states um, to be out there and actually you know, fix the problems that, that the rental companies can't fix. Um, but training is probably the, the biggest thing. You know, we have five dedicated trainers around the country. So we have, in each state, we have a dedicated trainer. So that can deliver basic, you know, one-on-one -on -one 
um, around the machine or more detailed in a classroom, two or three days, really getting into um, you know, high level analytics. Um, and then telematics is now something that's really coming into mm -hmm. you know, how to fix machines. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you have telematics on majority of machines now? Uh, not on the majority. Uh, we are still working um, with some of our different products because, again, we've got a number of different products. With the we do the cat lift trucks on the full truck side and the coney cranes on the big uh, container hand, the reach stacker side. Coney cranes do have their own inbuilt uh, system, um, which is your coney cranes or True Connect, and that's been fantastic for us and uh, certainly use that a lot. Um, the cat lift trucks, they don't have their own direct uh, product, so we do an aftermarket one for that. And we're actually trialling the Hawlett um, product at the moment on some of our fleet. Probably we'll look at doing it on the bigger equipment first because you know, you've always got to weigh up cost versus benefits as well. So we'll look at doing it on the, the bigger equipment, the booms and so on first, and then sort of weigh up the importance of it for the scissors, etc. Uh, yeah. down the track. So, so from a Hawlett side, what, what solution do you have on the telematics? Yeah, so we call Chirpal. Um, it's something we're seeing growing fairly rapidly, probably in the last two years. We probably saw 5, 10, 20%. So now we're probably up to about 40% of what we sell is going out with telematics. Um, the features really are probably, obviously, fault finding, you know, location. Um, but probably one of the big things we're seeing now is battery maintenance, you know, especially on you know, with electric rough terrains are becoming more and more popular. Being able to see the health of the battery, you can actually um, remotely uh, top up the water on the batteries, um, see how the health of charge has been. So if you need to actually get out to a machine because you can see one of the cells in the battery is starting to play up, you can get to it in advance before it actually becomes a, you know, a, a big cost to the business. Mm. And then so from a telematic side, like obviously fault finding is a big component mm -hmm. for the service component. Is there any other aspects that you see that you could use the telematics as an add-on product for your customers? I think certainly for our customers, they also like to know how their drivers are using their equipment. <laughs> so they like to know if they're doing it correctly, um, if they're having any impact damage or if they're actually going too fast, etc. cetera. So, um, and also making sure that they know who is actually using the equipment at the time and that they are licensed to do it so often the, the setup is is that you need to be in the system to be able to use the equipment so there's a lot of safety type connections and features to it as well for the customers that they like yeah and i can definitely see like having telematics on uh, your machines even the, the logistics the transport planning side knowing exactly where the off hires have occurred and so when you're doing the deliveries or pickups you can sort of plan your route a bit more, where before it was kind of like, ah, oh, that's the address, I think it's there. Has it moved out of a ring fence? What's currently on hire? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Potentially as well. Like there's all these things that I think as things get built up more and more, like rental companies can use that as almost like an add-on charge. Hey, did you want this feature that comes with all these things? Then you can know exactly what's on the job site. Even to the point of compliance, I think, being able to tell someone they can't turn the machine on until they do a pre-start maybe, or something like that. That's correct, yeah. Um, all those added things add safety and compliance and a lot of the T1s, like they'll just chomping at the bits for that sort of stuff because yeah. they can control their, their safety. That's correct, yeah. And I think that's where the industry is going to head to. It's still pretty new for our industry in terms of telematics and I think that's where we're going to head towards is some of that, as you say, pre-starts. But even utilisations, you think about on a big infrastructure project that's many, many, many kilometres long, is there a scissor lift or a boom lift sitting over in the corner there that's just not being used? Mm. You know, and if you could turn up to site and say to the project manager, probably not good from a revenue standpoint, Dave, but you know, hey, you've got a hundred machines on hire. There's three machines here that haven't turned on in a month. Let's off hire them for you because clearly you don't need them and it's gonna save you some money. And being able to go to your customer, you know, with some really good data and actually, you know, hey, I'm here to help you. Next time they come around to do a project, you're the first one they're gonna be ringing to say, hey, this guy actually wants to work and partner with me. And I think that's some of the stuff. And even as you say, the safety standpoint, what we can see in, in telematics too is the height that they're gonna be using, which then 
hopefully in the future could drive purchasing decisions because am I buying an 80 foot boom because that's what I've always bought, but the customer's only going to 12 meters or 14 meters, you know? Mm. One day in the future, do we check what loads they're putting in? You know, uh, we need a high capacity, 500 kilo, or 300 kilo, or whatever capacity, but they're only putting 200 kilos in it. And we're, put, we're paying extra for a machine that we might not need to be doing. Mm. Yeah. And the last part <clears throat> we'll have on our stand here is a new product called Farsen, which is a harness detection system, uh, which will be able to see then link through telematics also, is the person wearing a harness every time they actually hook into the machine. And so, 400 staff, you said that you guys 450, have? 450. 450, yeah, so absolutely. I can't even imagine what goes into like making sure that everyone's safe <laughs> at work. So what are some of the things that you, you put in place to make sure that uh, it's a safe place uh, within United? So we've been fortunate, we're part of a, a larger group as well, the Elphinstone Group. Um, so Dale Elphinstone is the actual ultimate owner of our business. Um, and he, I don't know if you've heard of William Adams uh, in Melbourne, in Tasmania. So we, one of Dale's favourite sayings is still shamelessly, which we did from their business. So a lot of the safety features and so on that they had throughout their business, uh, we stole shamelessly to implement in ours, uh, including one of the things that we do have is uh, we have four life-saving rules um, that are clearly displayed everywhere for the people, just to remind them, you know, don't put yourself in the line of fire is one of the rules, um, how we actually use tools and plant and equipment and the actual uh, vehicles, etc., as well. Um, and also fitness for work, making sure you come to work fit because we want you to go home the same way you come to work. So it's always continually promoted uh, through our business. Uh, we've even come up with a slogan, safety for you and me. Um, so if we actually need to, belongs to you and me, sorry. So we need to make sure that they take responsibility for their own safety mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. And then so on the, the fleet side, obviously uh, the types of machines that are getting uh, supplied are evolving. Uh, electric is obviously becoming a big thing. Like, well, what are some of the trends that all it's seen uh, with the, the evolution of the types of machines? Yeah, it's funny. Whenever everyone always talks, you know, green, um, EWPA, you know, the EWP industry has always been very green. You know, 65, 70 percent of all machines sold ever are electric, electric scissors. Um, the electric rough terrain is is definitely coming. Um, the one thing that we've got to remember in access equipment as opposed to every other type of plant is when an EWP goes up in the air, it's not consuming any energy. So if the scissor lift goes up in the air, the operator could be there for half an hour, an hour, two hours, three hours. The engine's not running, it's not burning any energy, it's not like a forklift or an excavator that it's running hours and hours and hours. And we quite often, we can see a machine at 10 years old, sometimes with three, 400 hours on it. In, in 10 years, you know, it's, it's next to nothing. However, electric is definitely, you know, the, the way it's, it's heading towards. Um, we are trialling hydrogen as, a, as an alternative fuel source. You know, like Europe's definitely looking down that path. Um, the UK is pretty heavily in at the moment. Um, we're actually trialling a, a machine in Paris at the moment with a hydrogen fuel cell powering the, or recharging the batteries, mm. which I think is an interesting, you know, take on, on how to get um, you know, alternative fuel sources to just electric. Yeah, and so from the, your customer perspective, what are you you seeing at the moment? Are they wanting more green related machines? Absolutely, a number of our customers are, and we've uh, worked extensively uh, with a number of our customers to understand what their requirements are. Um, Hallett have been great to work with us in some of those aspects, and we've been able to present uh, concepts and ideas so that they can have input of what sort of things uh, may be developed. I think it's still got a long way to go in the industry and um, certainly uh, even on the forklift side there's a lot of development and so on, on in the electric space. Where the challenge still is is obviously with the access equipment going on to sites, often their construction sites don't have any power to actually recharge the equipment and that's why the hydrogen generators and so on are another element that will I think help with that but still got a bit of a journey to go but working with our customers understanding their requirements is equally as important as working with our suppliers to then feed that to say this is what they're asking for how can you assist with that. Yeah I think once the infrastructure gets built up more and more and more it gets a bit easier but you kind of need those T1s to take that leap 
and push the boundaries a little bit until that happens. But like Dave mentioned there, the challenge always is it's a construction site mm. and there's no power. Mm. You know, and that and that's what really makes especially for EWPs, because you're there at the start. You know, you're erecting the steel when there is nothing else on the job site. Mm. The power doesn't come for many, many months. So, and that is the real challenge. And you know, we've put range extenders on, on lots of our um, machines, our electric rough terrain machines, that it is a diesel engine to recharge the batteries for when there is no power, but it's still a diesel engine, mm. you know. Um, on all of our boom lifts for, poof, five-ish years, we've had start-stop technology. Same as what you have in your car and you come to the traffic lights and your engine turns off. We've had that now in our booms for about yeah, five or six years now. So the guy drives into position, he goes and starts doing his work, the engine shuts off. When he wants to move, and he might you know, drive forward a metre or come down or up or down, engine restarts. So while it's sitting dormant, again, as I say, it's not burning any energy. And look, we're also looking at the way to bring the bigger machines down to much smaller engines by changing the drive systems in them. So changing to a more efficient drive system so we can bring the kilowatt engine down significantly so you're not burning anywhere near the diesel. You know, you used to have a 36 kilowatt engine to run a big machine. Some of these machines now we're running a 17 kilowatt engine which is, you know, quite a small, which would normally run on say a 45 foot knuckle boom. Yeah. And then I guess like when these new types of machines get evolved and United's talking to their customers about it, like how do you engage with, with businesses to, to make sure that what you're building is, is going to suit the end customer? Probably one of the, the, you know, if I go back to the GFC, it was probably a, a really good thing for Hallett. And as bad as business going down by 70% globally was, it made us stop being a European centric business. You know, and we were so focused on Europe and building machines for Europe. And Alexandre did a, an amazing thing coming out of, coming out of COVID and, and invested heavily in R&D. And you know, for a business that had just hemorrhaged money and he decided we need to change and we can't be a European only business. So we put a whole new design process in place and, and really worked on what we did with our customers and you know, every year we'll have product managers out in Australia and all around the world and they will sit and they'll say, hey, we want to build a new 80 foot knuckle boom, let's say. And we'll get the feedback, what do you need? What do you want? What's good in the machines you have now? What's bad in the machines you have now? What, you know, if we had to give you more capacity, but you had less average or if you want more average and we work there and then we come back a year later with the concept of this is what you told us. How does this look? And importantly, looking at what the customers are actually asking for. So we do it with the salespeople, understanding what the customer wants from a sales perspective, but also with our rental BDMs, what the rental companies are also looking for, and they take all that feedback into account. I was right. only reminiscing with a, I was in France last week, and I was reminiscing with a colleague um, who's part of our product marketing team, and she was out as we were building our new 45 foot straight many, many, many years ago. And I had her on a, a construction site in Melbourne with, with one of your sales reps, talking to the rigger on what he wants on a boom lift. You know, and to get that direct feedback from the guy who sits in the machine for six, seven, eight hours a day welding to the product manager that then is gonna go back and design it is just priceless. Absolutely priceless. And she was just, you know, again, telling me how wonderful an experience that was that it's, well, it's all great sitting in, you know, beautiful head office designing a machine, but being at the coalface, talking to the guy who knows the machines better than any of us because he spends his entire, you know, work life inside a boom lift. Yeah, that's very good. Mm. And so from the United standpoint, what's your involvement with the Hire Association and the WPA and stuff like that? Uh, so we've been involved... Uh, for quite a number of years, as I mentioned, Doug Rawlings has definitely been uh, key for that and uh, has helped with our business uh, understanding and utilising the resources from the EWPA, um, even with things coming in like PPSA, making sure that you know we were online and uh, getting some advice and direction from that as well, um, but also being able to give our thoughts and so on, which they always listened as well. Um, the HRA, uh, we've been a part of it and we do do a joint stand with Orma Crawler uh, um, 
uh, every year for the last number of years. Uh, so we're actually here uh, with a stand on the show as well. Yeah, Bob Mills? Yes, Bob Mills, yeah. correct. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So we actually knew Bob from the JLG days as well. Um, and yeah, no, work with him now with the whole crawl. Yeah. And is any of your staff involved with any of the, the higher association programs, like the Young Professional Network? Uh, we do. Women this, in Hire? Yes, we have this year. We actually had um, three people from uh, uh, WA involved in it. Um, so there's one lady here, she's a trainee BDM. Um, so she's actually going to be spending some time on the stand and has actually been doing that uh, uh, Women in Hire um, program and uh, will be graduating uh, in this particular one as well. It's amazing. And then from the Hallett side, you're involved as well with those programs? Yeah, so we've got um, Henry's in the Young Professional Program at the moment. He's our um, sales guy in Melbourne. Um, we've had heavy involvement in the apprentice, so there's a fair bit of work in the apprentice space too. So we've hosted um, quite a few of the uh, apprentice training programs through the hiring rental at our premises in Dandenong as well. Yeah, because I think strategic alignment training, they've got that whole uh, uh, course that you can go through and get involved and whatnot. I think they do some really good stuff just to try and get women involved, get them mentors, and they've got young professional and the training aspect. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the association's done a very good job of like bringing people together. It, it's, you know, again, I, I joined this industry where I was around 25 years old and, you know, and I, and I remember my first day, I sort of got handed the car keys and, you know, go off and sell some machines. I was like, okay, great. You know, that, that was my induction into the industry. And you know, I kind of found my own way to the, to the association. And, and, you know, Tim Nuttall, who's uh, been a you know, great advocate for the association, sort of took me under his wing in the association. And, you know, and I started going to meetings and then got on the, the committee. And, you know, I think it's like anything, the more you put in, the more you get back. And, you know, I've really tried to put into the association because it's, I feel it's given me a lot over the years and I've learned so much and you know, I remember sitting back at, at these meetings and you know, I felt like a young fellow at the time and now I'm probably on the other end of that spectrum but I remember sitting back and looking at guys like Tim Nuttall just going, wow, you know, you've got such a wealth of knowledge that he's willing to impart and just you know, tried to soak it in as much as I could. Yeah, and I think these types of events are really good because if, it, if this whole event didn't exist, you're kind of like just trying to tread your way through to meet people and, and network and whatnot. And then the hire association in general is like a great place because people are so relaxed. They're happy to talk to the competition. They're happy to share knowledge and whatnot. And so anyone that's young, like I think uh, Bob Mules was saying uh, yesterday or the day before, it was just like, it was impossible. Like when it first started, it was like you didn't know where to go, what to do. Where now you just you turn up, you go to one of these events, and someone's going to introduce introduce you to that person and that person, and you'll see that face. You become that they they know you next time. Mm -hmm. So it's a great place for like young people to get involved. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, it's definitely evolved from uh, from where it was many many years ago. Yeah. So a separate topic, which I, I, I'm interested to get your perspective on. Um, so. Greg Parfit was uh, on the stand yesterday at uh, the, the Welcome at uh, the Young Professional Network, and he was he was talking about Orange High getting acquired uh, recently, which was uh, United United mm. Rentals. <laughs> so it's now public knowledge, so I can say it. Um, but that's, that's a big thing. That's uh, like obviously they, they purchased Royal Wolf uh, a few years ago, a few years yeah. ago and it's just a shipping container. But Orange High is it's a bit of a different company that they're buying. Uh, now you've obviously got the name United, which probably, <laughs> which probably annoys, annoys them quite a bit. Yeah, uh, sure. What's your thoughts? What's your thoughts? Maybe I'll start with you, Dave. But what's your thoughts so far on the acquisition? Because they're not going to come in soft. That's for sure. Sure. Um, yeah, it'll be an interesting sort of dynamic as it progresses. Um, I think we have developed uh, the name substantially over the years. Uh, we became United, as I said, in 2005. So. Um, and we've had United Rentals on our rental equipment um, pretty much uh, for a long, long time. And so for us, it will be an interesting dynamic in terms of how that plays out. Um, but at the end of the day, um, it's about relationships. Uh, we're in the people business. We have strong relationships with a lot of our customers um, and with all of our suppliers. And so we hope that we can just continue to provide the service that we do and um, customers will respect who we are. Yeah. Um, as you say, the spaces that they're currently investing in aren't affecting us uh, in containers and, and roadwork sort of things. So 
at this stage, not a concern, but mm. certainly if uh, they start going into the access and pull through space, uh, it will be an interesting dynamic that only time will tell. Yeah, what, what it was funny, I was talking to this company in Brisbane uh, this a while ago, and we were just chatting about something, and then he was like, oh, United Rentals, and I was like, oh, they're not a company here. But then he was talking about your company, yep. and the United Rentals, I was like, yeah, it's going to be an interesting dynamic to see how this whole thing plays out because you've got such a, a history in the in the in the, in the um, in Australia. So yeah. it'll be and, and it is already causing some confusion. Even sometimes uh, payments coming through on uh, statements, we get a call and say, "Why have you taken money out of our account?" And we said, "Sorry, that isn't us. It's <laughs> actually <laughs> in Australia." So, so yeah, so it has already started causing some confusion. But um, yeah, it's be interesting how it all unfolds. Uh, what's your thoughts? Yeah, it's definitely interesting, you know, biggest rental company in the world. Um, when they bought Royal Wolf a few years ago, I thought, wow, that's a really odd acquisition, you know, to go and buy this, you know, container rental business on the other side of the world. Um, and it, at the time, it made me think, this is the, put the toe in the water and then, you know, start to look for other other opportunities. Um, you know, Orange High is a fantastic business, probably a great size to buy too, to put your toe in the water. I think when I listen to Greg, it was a six or seven branches. Mm. You know, so probably a good size number of employees and branches to really, again, get in and cement your feet. I wouldn't be surprised if they go around and acquire other businesses like, whether it's, you know, in the earth moving space or then into the access world. Um, uh, we've seen what they've done in the US. They're pretty aggressive in terms of acquisitions. Um, you know, and they've obviously got lots of money, so I don't think that's uh, <laughs> it's a real problem for them to go and you know pick up some some business. And it's probably not a bad thing for the industry. You know, some consolidation probably isn't a bad thing. You know, and the one thing that consolidation does is actually usually brings rates up because you've got less players. You know, all fighting for it, and consolidation usually helps increase rental rates. And yeah. um, you know, increased rental rates means increased you know sales price of machinery, <laughs> and it works well for all of us. <laughs> Everyone's a winner. Everyone's a winner. <laughs> um, so I like to always finish on this question. So uh, I want to start with you, Dave. So how do you, as a personally and within the organisation, define success? Oh, for me, success is always about the people. Um, if you have a, a group of people in your business um, that enjoy coming to work and are part of work, um, because that's where you spend most of your time, um, then you've actually succeeded in generating a place that makes sense for people to be at. Um, we've got a lot of long-term people working for us. Um, as I mentioned, I've been in the business 30 years, but the general manager of operations, Michael De Jong, is 30 years. General manager of sales and marketing is 30 years. The executive team, which is only four of us, is a, over 110 years, a sort of united experience in itself. Um, so people definitely is the biggest aspect of success um, that I would actually see. Uh, for me personally, um, I think it is just seeing people enjoy their work. Um, because that's, as I say, where they spend most of their time. If they're not enjoying their work, then life's hard. Mm, 30 years, that's a pretty amazing. I hope you have some of the names on the wall or something. That's like, uh, <laughs> that's, that's what this little badge is. Uh, oh, amazing, yeah. That's, well, a, so. that's a wealth of knowledge within uh, just being able to like just talk to somebody and get insight, basically. Uh, that's that's an amazing achievement. Mm. And it obviously talks about your culture as well in the organisation. Certainly, yeah. You can talk about, your, and I, I think, I don't know if you want to tell your trade secret, but they have a really great thing they do as an anniversary every year for their staff, and they give them Lego. So as they they stay in the business, their Lego grows. Oh, wow. So you walk around their office, and you see different sets of Lego on each person's desk, and it's a, it's a really cool thing to walk around and see. And you can... Again, you walk into Dave's office and there's a lot of Lego. <laughs> but, you know, and when you walk and they have such an amazing culture of people that are not just 30 years is unbelievable. There's so many 10, 15 plus year people. And yeah, you walk into these offices and you see this great little, and everyone builds it in a, into a different structure. Um, and it's such a great 
simple thing. And, I, and I, I, every time I, always, I see it, I say to myself, I need to steal that idea. Yeah, yeah, um, right, yeah, so. it was a, we actually stole it from someone else. The CFO actually saw it in one of his mate's businesses. And so it's just a little, little platform with the person's name and start date on it. So the first year that they get this, and then they get a little Lego person as well with years of anniversary. And then each year they just get another Lego block with the year number on it to build it. Oh, very um, nice. Want so your one's going to the roof, basically. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, some, someone, when we first introduced it, there was a person that was going around, particularly at head office, and obviously had a Lego set at home. And so they were bringing in different hats and hairstyles and so uh, on and putting on people's different things. <laughs> so it was quite a lot of fun. Uh, so I've got a captain ship uh, hat on mine. And so <laughs> I built mine a bit like a ship that I'm sort of <laughs> sitting at. The uh, that's a very good idea. Uh, Keith, from how do you define success? Uh, unfortunately, I hate to say, very similar, you know, and I don't have the, the 30 years, but, you know, now 14 years at Hallward and I look around my leadership team and Robin, we just celebrated, Robin was our number one employee when we started the business 25 years ago and um, two weeks ago we just celebrated her 25 years with Hallward and, and I look around the team and uh, Christmas time I bring all of the team in and, and their partners in for, for the Christmas party and every year I get that choked up feeling when I go to do the, the Christmas speech of just a sense of, of, of like a proud dad, you know, and I look around the room and my management team have, have all been with me, most of them over 10 years now, and you know, some seven, eight years. And I, and I, step, I look around the room and I look at my apprentices and I look at the, the service team and, and, and just what they've been able to achieve and, and come from a position, like I said, the GFC, the business was really down into a position of standing on our own two feet in a position of, you know, we can hold our heads high that, you know, we've really made a, a really great business on, on our own two feet. And yeah, so I, I look around the room and the, the, the speech usually goes off somewhere else and I get a little bit... <clears throat> um, and I think for me, that's probably the, 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 the sense of success for me. You know, I really, I feel pr like really proud of, of what we've been able to achieve um, as a business. That's amazing. All right, Dave and Keith, thank you for coming on the Rental Journal podcast. Thank you very much, Mark. Thanks Thank for having us, really appreciate it.